Hi, it's Richard Bowser from Property Investor News Magazine. I'm here in Hornsey in North London with Richard Blanco, who's a well-known London landlord and also a member of the National Landlords Association. Good morning, Richard. Good morning. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're here at, uh, at one of your latest uh, renovation development projects. Richard, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but uh, for the moment, um, can you just, uh, in, in respect of your capacity with the NLA, talk to us about what you're seeing with the regulation and licensing of landlords in the London region. You've covered this in one or two of your articles recently in the magazine, so perhaps can you refresh us in terms of, of, of uh, what you are seeing, what landlords are having to experience with licensing from local authorities and also government regulation as well. We're seeing a big spread of licensing now mm. across London. Um, quite a lot of boroughs bringing in borough-wide additional licensing. Richard, can you just explain for uh, landlords who may be relatively new to the sector in terms of the nuances, can you explain what you mean by additional licensing? Yes, additional licensing is where a local authority chooses to license all HMOs, that's houses in multiple occupation, within their borough, or it can be within a part of the borough. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the key point here is that the 2004 Housing Act definition of an HMO is, uh, can be as little as uh, three people living in two or more families. So it could just be a couple with a lodger. Mm -hmm. So it means that you know, any element of sharing um, becomes or defines a property as an HMO and then has to have a license. So under, under the additional licensing? Under the additional licensing, yes, because mandatory licensing, of course, has, uh, has to be three storeys um, with five or more people living in two or more households. Yes. Interestingly, the government is reviewing the definition of an HMO as well, um, <laughs> and uh, one of the suggestions is that that could become, they could remove the stories element, mm. so it could become five people living in two or more households on any number of stories, even just one story, so a bungalow could mm. become mandatory licensable. Mm. So that's a story that's yet to unfold. A story that's yet to unfold, absolutely. Um, stories that have been unfolding are the immigration check stories, yes. of course, right to rent. Right. So a lot of so, this regulation uh, seems to be targeted, at, 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 quite rightly, at rooting out the criminal landlord, uh, and yet at the same time it, it imposes a burden on, on landlords who, who do attend local landlord associations, who, who do abide by the regulations and, and therefore seem to be increasingly faced with, 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 with a burden of regulation and then licensing and at the same time when you've got a government that's recently just classified landlords as, as not running a business uh, from a taxation point of view seems to be a, you know, a, a very contradictory stance. Very contradictory and I think looking at what's going on with government policy overall it feels like there's a lack of vision, it's very piecemeal, it's responding to uh, public opinion yes. and the public you know, generally is, is very ill-informed by the media in terms mm. of what being a landlord is about. You know, there's a lot of media coverage of poor practice, virtually no coverage of good practice. No. And, you know, we know that um, over 80% of tenants are happy with their landlords. Yes. You know, most landlords have good quality properties and, and happy tenants mm. and treat the tenants very well, but that's a story that we hear very little about. 